right, so just to get started with, we've talked for quite a while this morning uh, about your family's history. You mentioned the fact that this all started with your dad all the way back in the 60s. All the way back in the late 50s, early 60s, yeah. Really? Yep, yep. Very instrumental because I know during that time that um, Daddy was, uh, at that time growing up in Dawson County, of course, Gober Sosby was from here and and was already very, very active with NASCAR at that time. So Daddy was very intrigued from that and uh, very... Um, very well possessed, pushed, whatever it, whatever it may be, that, that that was what he loved to do in the sport that he would want to or love to be in. I know we can remember, I remember me talking about a lot of the 40 Fords that were around here at that time and, and people running up and down the road. And, and you and I both know that uh, the 40 Ford was kind of the instrumental in all of that because of the flathead and, and what that would have, evolution that would go through and, and where the flathead went from from the time it uh, came out all the way to even close to modern day now what the flathead has done how deeply did he get involved in it in those in that time he went down i know that he spent some time with gober but he didn't really get involved in it until uh daddy started feed mail and a building supply over here across the road in the early to mid 50s and it was after that that he really got more deeply involved. And I can remember as a little kid uh, playing in some of the race cars they would build or the race cars, they didn't have many places to run at that time. So maybe the race cars would sit idle. Maybe they'd get wrecked. Maybe they would pull the engine out of one and, and the engine would be out for several weeks or several months and the car would sit there, so you'd find a place to go play, and you're a race car driver, and you sat in the car, and, and that was that was a fun time being a kid. When did the car dealership, when did the Ford dealership come into being? The dealership didn't come into being until middle of the year in 69 because I, that intrigued me for a long time on when Daddy bought the dealership because at that time I was just finishing up high school and getting ready to go to college, so... The it, it fit right in with me because the dealership, uh, I ended up going to North Georgia College at Dahlonega, which is now the University of North Georgia, and it was in the town that the dealership primarily had to be in, which was Dahlonega, but it had the territory of Dawsonville and Suches, so you could have done three dealerships out of that one franchise, but he built the facility in Dahlonega, and like I say, that, that fit in perfect with me because going to school at Dahlonega, you could go to school, which, uh, you know, going to college, your, your classes weren't from 8 to noon or they were at different times. And you could, even if the classes, maybe out of class in the morning, class in the evening, you could still work in between. So it worked out going to the dealership. But the dealership was actually bought on my mother's birthday May 28th of 1969, and that was when the dealership was officially daddy's, and then the dealership got open sometime. We The first building that we were in in Dahlonega was a, a building that's now currently a dry cleaner, but it was just a small building at that time, and I don't know originally what uh, what that building was built for, but it was a small, very small building, and it had very little park in which we're new to the business, so we didn't know much, so we made do with what we had, and it worked out for us for probably right at a year, and then Daddy did a deal. Uh, there was a building on the square, kind of on the corner of where Highway 19 and Highway 60 intersect right there, and uh, that building had been a Ford dealership in the 50s, and still had the Ford letters, which you saw a little while ago, still had those Ford letters on top of the building. But that building sat vacant for several, several years. And Daddy ended up leasing that building for a, for a time, and we were in it for, uh, I think we were in it for 
probably about three years because that building is very instrumental because we also talked about the fact that Daddy ran a equivalent cup car, Grand National car, uh, at Talladega, and Charles Barrett drove that car. Um, that was done in that building there in Dahlonega. Wow. Yeah, and it was the, uh, when they ran in 1970, I believe that was a 429 that they ran in that car, and that was a car that uh, the body had been changed. It was Donnie Allison's car that came from Banjo, the 27 car, which was just the 68 Torino, not the Talladega but just a 68 Torino, and they rebodied it as a 70 Torino because I've still got a hood off the car that uh, when it ran. Of course you do. Yeah, of course I do. <laughs> <laughs> when it ran Talladega because I, I love the hood because it was 429 cubic inch on the hood. Wow. So how did, how did you and Ernie and Bill <laughs> – transition from working at the dealership into racing yourself okay bill and ernie never really they there was a period that they left the shop which was next door here the the building that i tore down it was the it was the building originally daddy built as a truck shop here where we live at and uh ernie and bill were in that building and they had already kind of established themselves running short track, running the dirt short track. So um, when when Daddy moved out on the river at Dahlonega, once we moved from that building in Dahlonega, we moved again, and that was probably the summer of 74. We moved out to another building, which was an elementary school that was abandoned <laughs> at the time. You know, it's, imagine, you know, it used to be schools were kind of positioned over the county, and, and then they kind of came back in and brought them into one central location. Yeah. And imagine that. Now they're spread out yeah, again. Yeah, so yeah. so it went through a, tr a transition, and they figured out that, yeah, we need to spread them out again. So uh, Daddy bought that building from Lumpkin County from the school up there sometime in 70, late 73, early 74. But by the summer of 74, we were moving out on the river and there was enough space on in that building. I don't know the exact square footage of that building, but it was a really good-sized building. But it was long, and it was kind of narrow. It was built kind of like a ranch-style house. It's kind of long, kind of narrow, but it had a lot of room in it. So we could spread out this building down here. Yeah, that, the, the old school building. The old school building. You could spread out. Yeah, we could spread out in it because uh, it probably had... 10 classrooms in it and a lunch room so it it had a good many i would say now, that was that the race shop or the deal that was the dealership As and we brought all of that dealership. together okay i yeah. got you okay the all ford right. dealership and the race team all kind of, because you got to understand that the race team was was on a the ford dealership was really funding the race team because all of this was out of daddy's pocket. Wow. So it was funding the deal anyway. So by the 77, 78, we were full bore out there in that building at Dahlonega, and it housed the Ford dealership and what we were trying to do with the race team, because you weren't running the full schedule racing right, right. anyway. You you were running selected. You, you kind of took the stand that the Wood Brothers took initially in the beginning. Let's run the races that pay the most money, and let's focus on those because it was so expensive to go anywhere and do anything. It, it made it difficult. You were talking earlier about you guys were racing local. Mm -hmm. And you know around around this area, it, but your dad got the idea that he wanted to go cup, cup racing. Yep. Because Fords weren't getting a fair break. On the it. area around here, it was. You and I both know that that the racing got its start a lot of times out of Ford Chevrolet. The the Dodges weren't always as popular in this area, but it was Ford Chevrolet. And and that seemed to be, as we know from past years, 
uh, seems to be where most of the arguments start at Ford Chevrolet. So Daddy was, uh, as it was explained to me, if you cut him, he, he bled Ford blue. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, every truck that he owned, because we had to build and supply, and every truck that he owned was Ford. And uh, out of that, and we'll talk about that, we were making trips to Holman Moody. That was another part of, of what came out of the building supply and Daddy's love for racing. We ended up at Holman Moody out of that. But uh, during those years, um, it was it was a blend of... The building supply, the Ford place, the racing team, and, and all of this kind of blended together. And, and to me, it kind of made the package complete because you were, you were in, a, in a deal to where the, the Ford dealership was, that was the brand that you wanted to run. That was what you believed in. That was the car that you wanted to run. So we ended up running the Fords. Most everybody around here was Chevrolet. They were they were bow tie orange, and and the arguments would would come out of that. But through that, you found that going to the local race tracks, most of the people that ran the tracks or the tech people thereof were leaned a little bit more to the Chevrolet side. So, Daddy didn't feel like he was getting the right rulings on whether we went to the tech shed or not and and at that time you were running a 289 cubic inch ford because ford didn't have a 351 a windsor or a cleveland at that time so you're running those against a 327 wow. chevrolet engine yeah. so there was no way you were going to right, right the wrong on that and daddy came home one night after they had won a race and been disqualified and said uh, boys, if, if we expect to get fire treatment, we're going to have to do something different. So he said, um, he said, we're, we're probably going to do some NASCAR racing. And the question was, was, well, what series do you think you want to run? Whether it was, or was it sportsman then yeah. and, yeah. and grand national? Yeah. And, and, and he said, well, I've looked at the pay sheets Daddy was was very smart in laying this stuff out. He looked at the sheets on how much the pay was. He said, well, if we start a cup race, which is what we are now, but if we start a cup race, we are going to get more money than if we finish good in a sportsman race or a grand national race. So the money was better for the cup series. So it was we skipped everything else <laughs> and 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 came on in and um were you ready did you feel ready of course not <laughs> <laughs> you had no idea what you were doing I, I remember going to rockingham that was some one of the first races that uh daddy went there and ran the what would have been the bush series at that time with the torino that we'd gone to talladega with and Jody Ridley drove the car. And I can tell you by the way that we were prepared and and you grow up, all these people are your heroes. You grow up idolizing all of these people and you look around and it's like, can't believe I'm here and what am I doing here? Yeah. Because these people, these teams all – uniforms, very well equipped, very, because anything that tore up on our car, we'd either have to go borrow or buy. And there, there was nobody that you really knew to go borrow anything from. And you also got to find out too, how different the parts were, because if you had a Ford, you ended up usually having to make a lot of things for a Ford where that's where Chevrolet was very good. They made a lot of com components that were interchangeable. On the Fords, not so much. So even to adapt a, uh, in, in the earlier times, noticed that a lot of teams were running a Borg Warner or a GM transmission on a Ford, well, you think it would just bolt up. Nothing bolts up. And, <laughs> and like I said, you, you ended up, if, I, I think if you ran a Ford, especially through the 60s and the 70s, you were very well adapted on being able to engineer 
most any part you needed to make, more so than Chevrolet, because Chevrolet, like I said, was so good about making components that would marry together where Ford wasn't. The okay. Just so many things about it that Chevrolet did right on their parts and performance line that, that Ford didn't do. I know this may be a sacrilegious question, but was there ever a chance because Chevrolet <clears throat> had the parts and provided the parts and so was there Daddy, ever a chance? Daddy bled, bled Ford blue. Okay, all right. <laughs> no, no. Well, I, I was pretty sure I knew that answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, know that answer. But through the building supply, Daddy had the, had the Ford trucks. So uh, through the 60s, this would have been the early 60s, probably about 62 or 63 because – uh, some of the first trips to home and Moody. I don't think I made my first trip to home and Moody until probably sometime around 65. But I know that Ernie and Daddy went because Daddy was buying, Ford would take a car off the assembly line, and then that's what they would make their race car from was a, was a car that came off the assembly line. Eventually they did what they called a body in white where you could pull a body and a frame off the assembly line and build a race car. But in the early years, they just took a complete car off the assembly line, disassembled it, and built it back the way they wanted it, put the roll cage and so forth in it. So Daddy would go to Home and Moody, and they would have engines that were out of a, let's say they had a 63 Ford with a 406, and most of those were tri-power because they got the most high performance they could when they did these. And they would pull the engine transmission out, and Ford was already developing the 427. So the 406 was a motor that they sold. So you got a brand new 406, wasn't in a crate, it was just on a pallet, and it was a tri power, it was three twos. And they were 275, no, they were tri power, was 405 horse, I believe, because they were solid lifters. And, um, we were putting those engines in the trucks we had over here for the building supply because you could buy those. Daddy was buying those engines takeout for about 275 bucks a piece. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So so uh, he bought several of those, and um, through the association with Holman Moody, you know, it was all about connections anyway. Yeah. And, and through that connection, I wish Daddy would have gotten involved in the drag racing part, I would love to have one of the Thunderbolts. And there were several around here at the time. I didn't know how freely that those engines, the single overhead cams and stuff, once they started producing them, I didn't realize how many of those flowed through people's hands during that time and how much Ford was funding the kitty for these people to, to, to drag race. How did Bill become the driver? He was uh, he was the last one left standing. Uh, <laughs> um, he was, you know, I've been asked that question a lot, but I know for me, I know Ernie drove for Ernie drove some. I don't know if he drove first, but he drove some, and I drove some after Bill started running, but. I was so deep in it at the Ford place. That was primarily when all of this was was 69 and later is, is, is this evolution. And the Ford place, I would love to run on some, but the money wasn't there to support. It just wasn't there to support two cars. Yeah. And um, Daddy was running on a shoestring as it was. Um, I was working at the Ford place and I knew how much money the Ford place had. And, and I knew that, that daddy had structured that where eventually the Ford place would have been mine anyway. I knew how all of that was structured. I, I knew what that was all about. And, um, basically the race team for the most part bled it dry. There, there just wasn't anything left because when Melling bought in 82, Daddy had already, when Daddy passed away in 98, I went up there and uh, 
where he had moved to out on Burntstown Road at the junkyard. They had, they had, Daddy had sold the Ford dealership already. But I went up there and cleaned out all, I wanted to get all the paperwork because Daddy was bad to, you think it's bad in here. Daddy was, Daddy was pretty bad to scatter things around too. But usually everything was written down. You just had to kind of look for it. And I went and got all the bags of papers that were up there. And out of that was all the canceled checks from probably sometime 77 through probably 82 up to 83. And I got to figuring up the checks, the canceled checks in 81, which was the last full year daddy on the race team. And when I got to half a million dollars, I quit counting. And that was in 81. And he had done, it had done run its course. And and that's how the the team really got sold was because daddy had gone as far as he could go on his own. So as the as the team went on, were you were you working at the dealership or were you working on the race team? I, I was working at the dealership until Melling bought the team okay. in right. 1982, yeah. and Bill and Ernie both came to me and asked me if I would go to work for Melling. That that uh, there was a place for me if I wanted to go to work for Melling. That was the hardest decision of my life. Really? Yeah. Why is that? Because the dealership was basically mine. It was that was the way the paperwork was set up, but I knew the dealership was in financial trouble that I did not think it could overcome. And um, I think I went to work for the race team sometime, maybe March, maybe April of '82. I would assume that while you were working for the dealership. And I would assume that also that you were working on the race car some, yep, and and traveling on the weekends. I would I would imagine that you were kind of burning the candle at both ends. Isn't that what my generation did the best? I don't. The work ethic was. Burning the candle at both ends isn't, to me, what it's all about. It's the fact of priorities. And and it's like somewhere or another, we, we all, I think, get our priorities out of whack, and it really comes down to how much time do you need to spend at home. Every, 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 every case of this is individual on, on what you need to do. So... Um, you're you're either going to spend too much time away from home, too much time at home. There's got to be a blend here, and it it's got to be with if you're not married, that's great. You can you can kind of yeah. burn your candle at your own pace, whether you, whether you want to work twelve hours a day. But but Daddy was a workaholic. That's that's how we grew up, and it's just like now. You'll find even at the age we're at, you'll find. The three of us around here most all the time because it's. I got in a conversation just yesterday on how you can work your day, whether it be a go home six o'clock, whether you work a a day later than that or not, and you try to cut it off, and and it, it don't. It's it's like this morning, and and getting a hold of you. When you're on that schedule of being at the racetrack at 6 o'clock or you're up at 4 driving to the racetrack to be at the racetrack when the gate opens, it's hard to break this habit. And you'll find that most of the people that were the most successful in the early days were workaholics. Their brain didn't cut off. They go home and they, they eat, sleep, drink. This is what you thought about was how are you going to get up the next day and make that race car better or 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 how 
you know, in that movie Days of Thunder when Harry Hyde is talking to the car and and there's probably a lot of truth in taking personal all this stuff that you're doing and it being you're almost bringing that race car, it has a name. It it has the these transmissions, these gears, they have a name. The, they are <laughs> you, you you talk to them, you you <laughs> it, it, it's really it's really borderline insanity probably but that's how much you think about this yeah. and and it's hard to cut off and it's hard to channel it's it's hard it's it's almost impossible to change and that's what we talked about earlier on careers and what you've done your lifetime and and how passionate you are about it because there is a thin line and and you really have to be careful on what you do, but it's, it's, um, what is it they always, I've, I've heard the most all my life is, um, don't take it personal, it's just business, <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's not, so, um, you, you get into one of those things where you're, you're in a rhythm, and whether the days be 12 or 16 hours, I know when I went to work and ran the racetrack over at Jefferson for, for Jim Gresham, um, 16 hour days weren't uncommon and that was 10 years ago okay so 16 hour days weren't uncommon 